What's up, guys? What's up, man? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for being here and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, an initiative and launch an initiative that I am, uh, and I don't use this word often, but exuberant about, and not just enthusiastic about, uh, because I think it has the potential to make a real difference in real people's <coughs> lives. As you know, in the last number of years in San Francisco, we have paid special attention uh, to issues related to financial literacy. Uh, we have gone to great lengths to create some of the most innovative programs and products in the nation. We started with the first in the nation local earned income tax credit. And what actually was piloted originally in Denver, Colorado, but was quickly uh, dismissed after its pilot phase, the city picked up the baton and over the last number of years has provided for tens of thousands of people the opportunity to get a local match to the federal earned income tax credit. In fact, in 2008, uh, over 7,800 people took advantage, and families took advantage of that working families tax credit. We initiated from that program a strategy uh, to outreach to diverse communities of San Francisco, particularly Latino and African American community, uh, that were unbanked. We realized quickly that if you drew down the federal earned income tax credit, you got a local match of the um, earned income tax credit, that most folks are least about half of the Latino community and about half of the African American community had no place to put the money. They didn't have a checking account. They didn't have a savings account. They were going to check cashing places. As a consequence of that, we initiated with the great partnership and work of Jose Cisneros a program called Bank on San Francisco. Over 48,000 bank accounts have been opened in the last 36 months through this innovative program. Uh, this program has been modeled all across the country and recently was advanced uh, by the Obama administration uh, through the Department of Treasury just a few weeks ago. I had the chance to be out the White House uh, talking about the program uh, and looking at it's all good. Uh, no one pays attention when I get going anyway, so it's not like it's anything's lost. Uh, but the program's been now replicated in uh, not only cities across the country, uh, but the state of California, Bank on California, and now, as I said, with the Obama administration and the federal government's efforts, uh, this model uh, is now really taken off. We just launched in December a third leg of the financial literacy uh, stool to the extent that all of these connect the issue of finances uh, and educating people about uh, what's uh, afforded them, what uh, they should have. Prevail. It's all good. It's all good. Um, and that was Payday Plus, a program that goes directly at these check cashing locations, that goes directly to the issue of uh, usurious interest rates and annual percentage rates that are as much as 450 to 500 percent. Uh, already hundreds of loans have been provided through Payday Plus uh, with credit unions as partners and this model again is uh, being looked at and replicated uh, in cities large and small across the country. I'm struggling here <laughs> with audio but uh, we'll, we'll get it right guys. Thanks. Uh, now we're launching again with exuberance uh, what I believe is the most significant of our initiatives and that's a bold proposal and plan to provide financial literacy to provide a financial framework to provide financial advisor to provide a framework uh, for better money management uh, and a focus on availing people to the tools that only a few have uh, through a program today uh, with a partner uh, hello wallet the idea is to allow for the opportunity for every San Franciscan uh, to take advantage of a program that will give them the tools to become more financially literate, get the tools to make better financial decisions, decisions large and small, from whether or not to open a checking account, 
whether or not to open a savings account, what type of checking account, what type of savings account, how do you manage your money more effectively, how do you pay your bills more effectively, what is the best approach in terms of getting engaged with a bank versus a credit union, what's the difference between a credit union and a bank, what's the best tool in terms of getting a mortgage, is it a fixed rate mortgage or is it uh, a rate that changes on an annual basis, what is prime rate? What does it even mean? What does it have to do with my life? What can I afford? What can I afford? It's a kind of financial uh, source of support that people pay an average of about $150 an hour for. And less than 20% of Americans uh, avail themselves to. So you've got 80% of this country that has no basic connection to this information. And as a consequent, what, what happens? Well, you know exactly what happens. It's what's happened in this country in the last few years. You have predatory lenders, you have people marketing and selling their product that may not work for you and be in your best interest or your family's best interest, and that's where people get in trouble. You have folks that are happy to promote this fact, and I don't, this is a staggering statistic, and I'll quickly end, and Matt Fellows, who's the, the genius behind this, is the um, originator of this effort. Uh, this was a number he gave me that just knocked my socks off. That 38 billion billion dollars a year we spend in overdraft charges and fees. But 70% of people that get those fees have assets and savings that should be used or somehow connected to obviate those fees. Let me repeat that. The banks are enjoying financial illiteracy. The banks do very well with financial literacy. They made $38 billion just on overdraft fees and charges last year when Pew came out with a study that showed, again, 70% of people that got those fees assessed could have potentially seen those fees avoided. That in and of itself should wake folks up to the realities of what's going on in this country. I, I won't even indulge in the idea that 60%, it's estimated, of people that have money in institutions have money without that money making money, meaning they don't even get interest on the money because they just didn't know or they don't know that there's products out there where if they put a few bucks in a checking account, they can actually earn some interest on checking, not just savings account. All of these basic things that uh, people never got educated about, I didn't get educated about, I went to a pretty good Jesuit university, they never talked about financial literacy. My high school, Redwood High School, they never once talked about financial literacy. I showed this website, hellowallet.com, to some of my staff members, and they all writing down little information because a lot of things they had no clue, and let me tell you, this mayor had no clue about as well. So I am a happy consumer uh, of this product. I don't want to spend $150 hour, dollars an hour on financial um, uh, financial consultant that's going to most likely direct me to a product that he probably or she gets a commission on or there's something happening behind the scenes that I don't know about. This is a way of democratizing financial information. There's no connection to a bank. There's no connection to products. This has been funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Haas Foundation. Pam uh, David will speak in a moment or behind this. The Clinton Foundations, where I first heard of this, is behind this. This is the first city ever to launch a ubiquitous effort to outreach to its entire population, partnering with labor unions like Local 261, the laborers that you see behind me, reaching out the private sector, the Chamber of Commerce, PG&E, the Public Utilities Commission, and all their customers regionally as a way of promoting a product for $3.20 a month, less than a couple cups of coffee or a latte, venti latte probably at some of these places, and you can get that information that can empower you to be a better consumer, to save money, to make choices that can make a difference in your life and your family's lives. To me, if you want to get serious about poverty eradication, you've got to get serious about financial literacy. Stop wasting our money and time on preaching the issue of dealing with poverty eradication if we're not going to fundamentally change the framework of educating people and giving them the tools to empower them, to build confidence and self-esteem so they can ask the tough questions and not get uh, hit by these large organizations that have no problem nailing people because that's where they make their money, credit card companies and big banks. I'm not trying to be a populist here, but I know the abuse. You know the abuse. You guys have written about the abuse. You talk about the abuse all the time. Uh, and the only way it changes, the only way it changes, you can regulate till the kingdom come. They'll hire 50 more lobbyists to find loopholes. You know that, and I know that. The only way to change this is empowering real people. 
And that's what Hello Wallet does. It empowers real people. You want to get serious about financial reform? Reform it with real people having better information and asking the tough questions, the right questions. And these guys will be forced to change their ways because the consumers will demand it. It will never happen in Washington, D.C. It sure as heck is not going to happen in Sacramento. And with respect, all our little efforts here are meaningful but not enough to have a macroeconomic change that this country deserves. So that's why I'm exuberant. I'm sorry to be preachy. I'm pretty passionate about this. Uh, and I really believe in this, and I'm very, very excited now to introduce you to the brainchild behind this uh, who can speak much more eloquently about it, um, and that's Matt Fellows, uh, who, uh, with Roberta Actenberg and others, came to me uh, a few months back with this opportunity and idea, and he will also let you know that he is providing, I'll leave this to him to announce, the opportunity for people to get this at no cost, not just the $3.20 a month, uh, and how he was able to do that. Uh, you'll hear from Pam, David, and others about their support making that available. So this is a free opportunity for low-income households as well as a low-cost opportunity for hundreds of thousands of households. And the one question I'll have with people that don't do this is why didn't you do this? Uh, why did you miss out on this opportunity uh, to uh, take advantage of the good work that Matt Fellows has done and this program called Hello Wallet. And you can ask him why the name Hello Wallet? Where did that even come from? Uh, exactly. And then he'll also tell you how you can get online today and avail yourself of this opportunity. Matt? Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. We're delighted to be here today to launch this partnership with San Francisco that will provide, as the mayor said, all households in this city with access to independent financial guidance for the price of a couple cups of coffee. And to put that in perspective, today financial guidance costs on average about $150 per hour. So this is a substantial discount relative to what uh, typical financial guidance costs today. Uh, this partnership will help democratize access to financial guidance. As the mayor said, only about 20% of U.S. households today have access to financial advice. And a big reason why that is is because it's just been so expensive. So we're thrilled about this partnership to be able to provide all uh, households here in San Francisco and all over the country, for that matter, with low-cost, affordable, honest financial advice. I want to start by saying thanks to a handful of uh, people that made this possible. First, I'd like to thank the mayor and the treasurer. Um, San Francisco, as the mayor said, is going to become the first city in the country today to provide financial guidance to all residents. So San Francisco really is going to be uh, at the leading edge of this effort to help democratize access to financial guidance. I would also like to thank uh, all of our other terrific partners in the city. That includes the Chamber of Commerce. Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, the Laborers Union, Walter and Elise Haas Fund, the Levi Strauss Foundation, uh, San Francisco Public Utility Commission, and EARN. A special contribution from Walter and Elise Haas Fund, the Levi Strauss Foundation, and PG&E will also give free access to our financial guidance service to over 2,000 households today. In addition, we have pledged to provide one free subscription to our service to a needy family for every five subscribers from San Francisco. And that will be an ongoing commitment. The idea here is that everybody in San Francisco can help themselves get ahead, but also help others that are less fortunate at the same time. Finally, I want to thank Roberta Actenberg. Uh, Roberta has been a major driver of this partnership, and um, she's just a true San Francisco treasurer, as I've discovered, and it's been a real honor working with her over the last few months. I want to spend uh, just a couple minutes, uh, remaining minutes, uh, talking about the importance of what we're, we're all doing here today and in the months to come. As some of you know, I used to be a scholar at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., uh, where I studied consumer finance problems. And the depth and breadth of those consumer finance problems would be difficult to overstate. Uh, today. Most people, about 87 million households, or most of the U.S. household populations, not saving enough for retirement. Consumers owe $2.5 trillion currently in consumer debt, which includes about $1 trillion in credit card debt. Uh, millions of people around the country own, uh, owe more money on their mortgages than their homes are worth. 
I could go on and on. It's just, it's just a staggering um, set of statistics. But here's something hopeful that I also discovered while I was at Brookings. Most people today, regardless of their household income or their educational attainment, have extra money in their budgets that could be used to help them get ahead. The fact is that there's a hidden hole in the wallets of most Americans today that goes unacknowledged where extra money is seeping out of people's budget, which if plugged could help people find the extra money that they need to get ahead. And because I'm a Brookings guy and I love statistics, I just want to run through four examples of what I'm talking about with that hole. The first, about 20, we know from the Federal Reserve that about 20 million households today store more, more than two months of their annual income in their checking or savings account, earning low interest or no interest at all. Moving that money into a better performing product like a CD or an investment could create billions of dollars for these families over time. But most people can't understand these products today because they're incredibly complicated. Similarly, a recent funny, uh, study by Harvard found that about a third of fixed rate mortgage borrowers are paying more than one point above a going yield and have risk profiles that would qualify them for a better rate. There again, billions of dollars unnecessarily being wasted every year um, that could be put instead in savings accounts, investment products to help people go ahead. Third, we know that only 1% of people that have access to a 401k are utilizing the maximum contribution, and 20% aren't utilizing the match at all. There again, billions of dollars unnecessarily being wasted. And we know that billions more could be saved for U.S. consumers if they improve their credit scores before buying mortgages and auto loans. I could go on and on. It's just this hidden phenomena today that most people, regardless of their income or educational level, are losing money unnecessarily that could be instead put back into their pockets and help them get ahead. Putting that money back into people's pockets and redirecting it into savings accounts, investment products, and other safe and affordable uh, products is exactly what we're, we're all about at Hello Wallet. Uh, we look at individuals' members' finances and then prospectively identify for the user where there's overlooked savings opportunities in their budgets and where there's opportunities to reduce debt that they may have overlooked. The truth is that managing money today has become as complicated as maintaining a car. Just as we handed over our wrenches about 50 years ago when our cars became too complicated to maintain, we need to get serious about the fact that we all need access to financial experts today to help us make the most out of what we have. We must democratize access to financial guidance. It's not, any, it's not something any longer that only the wealthy in this country need access to. We're proud to be providing this service and are looking forward to reporting the progress as we go forward at building savings for households here in San Francisco, reducing their debt, and helping them get ahead. Uh, with that, I want to introduce Pam David, who's the Executive Director of the William and Elise Haas Fund. <laughs> There's so many house funds, it's so difficult to know them all. Um, I'm the executive director of the Walter and Elise House Fund, which has been a San Francisco institution for over 55 years. We're delighted to again partner with the city and county of San Francisco on the Working Families Tax Credit, Bank on San Francisco, and now with the Hello Wallet. When uh, Matt and Roberta came to visit us to tell us about Hello Wallet, we were very excited about it for a few different reasons. One is simply the scale. This issue of democratizing information and access to great financial information is real. Most of us don't have it. It's not just poor people who don't have it. It's the masses of us who don't have it. And the ability to be able to deliver it to scale in a sustainable model that, in fact, uh, in San Francisco, it's one out of every five paid subscriptions, then support someone who cannot afford a subscription. The thing that we wanted to make sure of is that from the very get-go, low-income families were able to participate fully in this program. And therefore, we made a philanthropic investment in this. We were very fortunate to have partners at the Levi Strauss Foundation uh, and other foundations will be joining in. Uh, foundations move at a glacial speed, uh, so not everybody was quite able to be uh, up and running at the time of this press conference and the launch of Hello Wallet, but I, there are a lot, there's a lot of excitement about this. The information that's out there now for consumers is mostly not impartial. It's based on a compensation, a referral fee, I send you this way and I get something back. 
the ability to have impartial, objective, good advice is invaluable. And part of what is attractive to us as a philanthropic institution is that it doesn't stigmatize poor people as a lot of services do. There's a lot of things that we provide that are only for poor people. You can only make so much, or you can only live in this zip code, or you can only have this profile. This is something that cuts across. We expect that lots of folks in city government, city employees, city retirees, and in the nonprofit sector, the staff of organizations working with very low income people will be using this tool themselves. And it has a different kind of power when you say, you know, I'm using this, I find it really helpful, and I think it'd be helpful for you, as opposed to saying, hey, you poor person, here's something for you. I don't need it, but it's for you. It's a very different kind of model. It's one that I think um, reflects tremendous forethought, great research, innovation and puts us on the right path for making sure that everybody in San Francisco really can be on a road to financial literacy. For the Walter and Elise Haas Fund, uh, we've had a strategy we've invested in over the last seven years that is about econo providing economic security for the working poor. And that is both about income, helping people get great jobs, career track with living wages, but it's also about being able to hold on to the money that you have and being able to save. For a lot of folks, the difference between being stable and unstable is having something in the bank, something to fall back on. Uh, we are very hopeful that with a lot of the great nonprofits, the partnership with EARN, which is going to be invaluable because we need to have a great local nonprofit working with other nonprofits to make sure that this tool gets rolled out and is accessible to all the folks who need it to be, uh, who need to have it and need to use it. Um, overall, we, ju we just, um, it's completely in line with our mission to invest in this as a philanthropic organization. We welcome, uh, again, to continue the partnership and we uh, are very thankful to Matt Fellows and Roberta Actenberg for bringing this to us. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ed Harrington, General Manager of the SF Public Utilities Commission. We're here because we have 160,000 customers in San Francisco and a couple thousand employees in the city, and we want to make sure that they have access to becoming more financial literate also. Um, we particularly are interested in the over 6,000 people that are low-income people who benefit from our customer assistance program, and we want to make sure they have access to this specifically. But in keeping with the theme you've heard this morning, it's not just about low income. Everybody I know could use a financial tune-up. Um, I often will talk to people, friends of mine, they'll say, I am paying more than 20% on a credit card, and you think, well, my God, how could you possibly let that happen? They don't know how to fix it. They don't know what, else the, uh, what the opportunities are, how they can do it. I actually have sometimes have gotten on the phone, pretended to be them, and lowered their interest rate on their credit card. Not the best way to do it. This is better. Give everybody the information, make it available to people, and let them be able to make their own decisions. So we're happy to be part of this effort to do that for all San Franciscans. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Ed. Well done. Um, so that's why we're here. Uh, again, I, I, this is one of those money-back guarantees. Uh, every reporter should be writing this down, not just as a story, but personally, uh, because all of us could be benefited uh, from taking advantage. And, and it, I, I wasn't kidding. It's exactly what our office did. We, we were uh, roaming, rummaging around in the site and went, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. Again, who taught us this? Uh, and the folks that... Uh, uh, try to explain this that you hire for 150 bucks they, they it's so damn confusing i don't know that anyone can actually you just send say yes to whatever it is they're trying to sell and that sometimes doesn't necessarily work to your best interest so that's the idea behind this and uh we're very very enthusiastic about this opportunity and again this is rolling out today the idea is to get as many san franciscans uh to take advantage of this the more san franciscans that pay the more people that can't afford it We'll get the same benefit and the same opportunity with that. Any questions? Yeah, what the heck is his name? Exactly. Um, let's, uh, so ask me that question in a year, and hopefully you'll remember the name of it. <laughs> we did a lot of research about it, and we wanted to create a, a name that was very friendly for people. That would be um, something that they would remember. Um, we're just, you know, a lot of people are intimidated today by financial services. Uh, just one other stat, we know about 87 million households today currently don't have confidence in bank, 
banks, and Edelman reports about 70% don't trust banks. So it was very important for us to uh, convey that we're independent from banks and that we're also very friendly and honest. Um, we want legitimately to help people get connected to the best opportunities that are out there to help them get ahead. And, and this was a big thing for us. I mean, you, you get these smart guys that come in, you know, Brookings, all these fancy folks come in, and we thought, all right, what, what's the angle here, Matt? What, what are you selling? Who's behind this? Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to get in the site all of a sudden. We're going to be redirected to, you know, some fancy product, and that's where the real money is behind this. Uh, so we did our due diligence, and uh, I, I don't want to say that he, you know, can't be corrupted down the road, but at least to this point, uh, he seems like a pretty good guy that, that I'm going to vouch for. And, uh, and he's got some incredible backing of, uh, of some pretty powerful and successful organizations uh, that uh, that do the right thing, and that uh, I uh, I think we all should be so lucky to be associated with, and so that's why we felt this was the right product to uh, promote and to partner with, and uh, why we're here today. Why did you choose San Francisco? Um, we chose San Francisco because uh, about 50 years ago. Uh, there was about 100 or 150,000 credit cards dropped um, for free in mailboxes here in San Francisco. And at that time, America was very savings conscious and didn't really use a lot of debt. That almost overnight created a viral culture of debt in this country, and it's added up now to about $2.5 trillion in consumer debt. And I'm sorry to interject, and I don't want to screw up your video there. But this is a really profound, again, I, you know, you guys, this may not be that exciting. Maybe there's something else today. But, but, but can you repeat this? You know, these, these, you, you go to college and you get 450 of these damn, hey, no interest credit cards, et cetera. And, and when did this happen? When you say dropped, what do you mean by that? Credit cards started. And, and why is this important? Because it's a really, I, this needs to be understood. Sure. So prior to that time, no one had credit cards and very few people used uh, debt besides mortgages. And what happened is that the credit card companies decided to just mail out free credit cards that were actually mailed to mailboxes um, throughout uh, San Francisco and Fresno as well. And, and they it, started here. And they t started here. So it, people don't know this. So, and that really gave birth uh, to the consumer uh, economic crisis that we're currently, I mean, a, a situation where four and a half million people can buy homes that they're never going to be able to hold on to. Those are, that's the number of people that are foreclosed. It's just, it's profound. I mean, it's just absolutely profound. And the, the roots of that tie back to uh, that credit card drop in the 1950s when for the first time Americans got access to easy credit, pay now, um, uh, I have buy now, pay later. And that really just transforms uh, the culture in this country and gave birth to this, this bet. So it was important for us to start in San Francisco because we want to uh, redirect the consumer economy. We want to give people access to that, that instructional manual that they never received in the mail back in the 50s and they don't receive today when they buy mortgages or auto loans or student loans. That independent instructional manual, manual that can help people figure out what products to consume and how to get ahead. Do you know why we were targeted fit back then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just curious. Um, I would have to rewind the clock. I, I'm not exactly sure why they started, uh, but it worked. They were smart. I mean, they're certainly very smart because it's... A specific credit card company? Uh, it was a, a, a group of uh, credit card companies that were dropping uh, credit cards uh, back in the 50s. It's interesting, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very. Any other questions on this guy? So how's it going to work? How's it going to work, Roberta? Mm -hmm. well, I, you want to talk about $4, sure. the discount? Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So uh, every household in San Francisco who lives in San Francisco who's got a San Francisco address will get access to the service at a 20% discount for the next six months. We're a uh, double bottom line organization, which means that we have uh, an explicit social mission. Part of that is that we have very low prices, so it's affordable to all Americans. All you have to do to get access to that uh, discount, which you can get access to Hello Wallet for as low as $3.20, is just go to hellowallet.com, enter in your, your zip code, and then you instantly qualify for that 20% six-month discount. 
The, the second thing that we're doing here is um, that we're providing one free subscription to a low-income family for every five paying subscribers here in San Francisco. So in that respect, everybody can get ahead in this country or in the city by, by also helping those that are, that are uh, less fortunate get free access to the service. So the six months discount is how much per month? It's, uh, it's, three, it's low as $3.20 a month. Okay, and then after that, what did, does it, it would go, go up, up to? It would go up to $4. Hmm? $4. $4. Four dollars. Yeah. So what, 44 bucks a year versus 30 minutes with a financial advisor, 30 minutes for $75 on average. Do you have to have it for like an entire year, or can you opt out at any point? You can opt out at any point. Um, and there's a money back guarantee, actually, for 30, so for 30 days. You guys cover me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's taken care of. Um, I also wanted to just re repeat that because of uh, generous contributions of foundations, there's going to be 2,000 free passes given to low-income families immediately. And so that's the idea of Ed Harrington, the outreach that will be the focus of our nonprofit partners, SF Earn and others and the other foundations to really get out the diverse communities in the city. Uh, it all goes back to, you know, our clarion idea of the digital divide as well and the concern about making sure there's broadband access and points of contact. That's why we'll be working in our public housing units and our opportunity centers and really reaching out uh, to promote this as we've done with Bank on San Francisco in a culturally competent way, Payday Plus. All of that is very well organized and those protocols are in place and well established from the Treasurer's Office. So we're going to build on all of that good work that's been done and get this out there. And then we're counting on you. We'll, we'll check your nightly news tonight to see what, you know, where you were on this. I'm going to say nothing purposely so I don't get, I, I don't, I don't blow the story. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for being here. Well, you know, we've been reading these reports that you're trying to, you or your team, you know, looking at the state constitution. It's, uh, it's amazing how some of this gets out there. Uh, but uh, it's all I'll say. It's just amazing how some of that gets out uh, or where it comes from is what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, some of it is uh, just interesting. I mean, there may be other people looking at some of that. And it's amazing how many people have interested themselves in this process. Uh, and it's certainly true that I've heard all kinds of remarkable things. This, this is worthy of a, well, I'm not sure it's worthy, but it's certainly uh, worth a good log in one's diary of life. Uh, the, the intrigue, the phone calls, the late night calls of this and that idea. And, you know, it's been an interesting couple of weeks, but uh, to the extent that I have an announcement, I don't, uh, not today. Are you concerned, though, about what would happen in terms of the Board of Supervisors, and do you support some of this uh, talk about a, a ballot initiative? Uh, in well, I, I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, you know, I think the people of San Francisco does, should always have the right to decide who their mayor is. Uh, I don't think it was ever anyone's intention to give that to uh, a district elected Board of Supervisors. Uh, not for an extended period of time, in emergencies, for an immediate period, uh, incapacitation and the like, I understand it. But for a potential of a year, I, I'm not sure that's what the voters necessarily had in mind, and I'm not convinced that's necessarily what they would like to see. And that has nothing to do with my running or not. I just think it's an interesting debate moving forward. Uh, I never really thought about it, um, that uh, that would be afforded. Uh, uh, a district elected board of supervisors. So I think it's a, a good debate generally, again, even if I didn't run, uh, is whether or not there should be a special election to decide who our mayor is. And I'm a resident. I'd like to be able to have some influence uh, about the future of the city as well as one of 849,000 of us that live here. And speaking to that, about your influence in choosing your successors, have you no, no, no. I mean, look, I, I'm, I, let's just talk abstractly here. Um, I'm, I, I used to say this as a joke many years ago, but it's true. I'm the future ex-mayor, no matter what. My time is, is coming up. Uh, so people uh, are very enthusiastic about that in some cases. Some are concerned about that and don't know what to think about it, and others may be disappointed, but that's reality. The charter affords you two terms. I'm in the seventh year 
uh, of uh, this remarkable journey as mayor of San Francisco. And so uh, there's an election for mayor next year, uh, regardless of any decision that I make. And so that will be uh, up to the people of San Francisco, whom they wish to choose to serve for the next four years once I'm gone. Uh, to the extent I make a decision about lieutenant governor's race, well, I've got to win. I've got to win a primary, I've got to win a general, and then perhaps if both of those elections are successful, uh, the voters may be asked earlier to make a decision or the board as it's currently constructed will make that determination and then the voters will ultimately have that opportunity next November to decide. Um, so that I know. Uh, I, there is an election for mayor next year regardless of my decision. That's the one thing for certain. What are you still debating in your mind? Why? I mean, oh, I don't need to bore you with process. I'll leave that uh, to more speculation. I, 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 I'm just focused. You know, I, I hope you see, I don't know, maybe you don't, but I, I, I sincerely love my job. Uh, I get very motivated and enthusiastic about things like we just did. Uh, I mean, I, we've had six meetings on this. I've spent almost a year working on it. I mean, this, is, this didn't just show up. This is exciting. And so that weighs heavily. But my time is numbered anyway. I'm, I'm, so it, even if I wanted to continue my role here, there's a mayor's race next year. Uh, so, you know, time, time is up soon, regardless. And so I, I know that, and I'm pragmatic about that, and I love public policy. I've said this to you on many occasions. I'm passionate about policy, and you sometimes, I know, rightly start rolling your eyes when I start listing off matrix of policy ideas and all these things. I'm trying. There's a narrative here, though. There's an anti-poverty narrative. There's a focus on environmental stewardship, health narrative. And I'm trying to sort of frame that and organize that. And, uh, and, and I don't want to just walk away from that. That's why I got out of the business sector, uh, where I had some success. It, it, it didn't fulfill me uh, to the extent that I thought I was making the kind of contribution that I could make in public life. And uh, I don't want to necessarily just give that up, uh, not because I need to be someone, but I feel like I need to do something in the context of contribution and purpose uh, and share my passion. Uh, and uh, that's for other people to decide. If I ever put my name in the hat, they have the opportunity to support or reject me. Um, and uh, there are many good people that, that, that have put their name in the hat for all kinds of races, and there'll be some good people put their names in the hat for the next mayor's race, too. If, 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 and, and you, you, know, you decide you're going to run, and you run, and then you win, this report about you saying, well, I would wait uh, a few days, you know, instead of January 3rd to January 8th, is that? I just got another text message about that. Yes, I talked to my lawyer, and they said, I, I, who has who even initiated this? So it's a good question. Do some investigative reporting. Because uh, I don't know. I'm not, no, these are people that are, no, that I just think, again, a lot of folks have a lot of motivation. Uh, around this race, and so a lot of people are looking at things like that. Uh, I, uh, I've done due diligence, but, but I haven't spent my days thinking about that. I've been spending my days uh, thinking about the substance of a, a race and what it takes. I have some familiarity what it takes, having just spent a year out on the campaign trail for governor, uh, and my responsibilities here and at home. And that's, that's, that's what my stated focus, and, and uh, it's, it's as consistent and congruent as it's ever been. Uh, and uh, I know I have only a few days to decide. And so this is the week. Uh, so there's no doubt this week I will let you know uh, what I'm doing. It will happen this week, uh, whether I say or go. Does it worry you who the supervisors might pick, or is well, it I'm more that I'm a San that Franciscan. I care deeply about the city. I care about its leadership. And I've said this on more than one occasion. I'm very concerned about some of the things that are coming out of the legislative side. I mean, we had two initiatives that were on the ballot that had to be pulled back that already were on the ballot. That's very, very, it's very important to have people of the city understand what's at stake. Uh, you know, there's an initiative on a rent initiative that's blatantly illegal on the ballot. It's going to mislead people as if it means something when I promise you, mark my words, keep this tape, it'll be thrown out. And how much money are we going to have to waste to do something? And the reason it's being thrown out is they didn't do their work. They didn't do their due diligence. Uh, and uh, I'm worried about that. So, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Well, regardless of how your decision is made, 
decision goes, I was standing here wondering how you're going to make the announcement, and I was thinking maybe you'll tweet it. And yeah. that made me think that the, the legislature and indeed some municipalities are coming up with laws about tweeting during public meetings. Yeah, I don't like it. I think we need, to, uh, we need to, to temper people like me and our tweeting exuberance. Uh, we, need, we need a way of stopping that. I, I agree with that. I, I, uh, I was up there when Assembly, uh, well, now uh, Speaker Perez was sworn in, and uh, I listened to him about all those lobbyists texting and tweeting, and you know what? It's a good point, I, and I paid a little bit more attention to that now. You watch some of these commission meetings, and people are on their Blackberry. You're going, well, what's going on? Are you disinterested, or are you so interested someone's feeding you some talking points or ideas or amendments? And that's not right. And so, interestingly, we are looking legislatively uh, at correcting that. You know, I don't want to take away from the story we announced today. I don't think this is that exciting a story, so I hope it doesn't get in the way of uh, financial literacy for every San Franciscan. Uh, but it's certainly uh, something that my office is uh, processing, and uh, I think Tony was ready to talk to you about it uh, soon, right? Yes, sir. Well, no, we'll take it away from but, but philosophically, what's, what do you no, think? I think it's problem? right. What's, what's the problem? It, well, I, I think there's a lot of lobbyists that are telling people how to vote and what to think and amendments. That's not right. Uh, there should be a more transparent process. So I, I do think there's, uh, there's some legitimacy to that, and I think we should look to curtail some of that uh, and, uh, and, and provide a, a greater level of transparency. Uh, it's interesting. You always have to keep up with technology, and so I think in many ways the technological advancements with PDAs uh, where people are telling you what to think and say uh, that has no transparency because no one's coming to the mic to say here's what I think and identify themselves is a legitimate public policy concern and uh, again when I listened to the speaker talk about it a couple weeks ago in Sacramento I thought boy that's interesting and talked to my staff about it and they immediately boy they had some strong opinions that surprised me they were even more intense saying you know what We've seen this. We don't think this is an issue. We know this is an issue. And as a consequence, I'll state it factually, we've asked the city attorney to draft legislation. Uh, where we are in that is um, to, it was either going to be done today or next week uh, for formal introduction. So I don't know where we are today. It would, uh, it would get, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, we're, they're lurk, working through the legal issues. So I don't want to give you the details yet because it's being worked through the, le the legal process. Uh, but to address this issue. Uh, we actually have some legislation that uh, we're drafting. But you wouldn't be able to bring your, your blackberries or whatever into the meetings? That's right. We're looking at You have certain, right? I mean, if, God forbid, there's an emergency you want to be at. Uh, it's, and that's what we're working through from a policy perspective. I mean, you have uh, computers, and you can get messages on, you got on the computers, that's, too. So how do you... exactly why I don't have an announcement for you and wasn't prepared to give you one. <laughs> it's an absolutely... This is exactly you should. You were as, as if you were in our... Uh, our room on Friday. Were you? I'm on to you. So when you make this, an, uh, when you decide on the lieutenant thing, whether you say yay or nay, yes. are you going to have a some sort of formal thing, or are you going to just do your YouTube stuff, or what, what are you going to do? <laughs> it seems to be in vogue, the YouTube stuff, huh? As uh, Jerry Brown did. Didn't Jerry criticize me for my YouTube, saying, what kind of announcement was that? that it, I liked his, though. It was very good. Um, I... I I, I, I'll say this, and you know, as a good, well, not you know, not necessarily a good standing, but as a, uh, a good Catholic, uh, I uh, I could say God is my witness. I have not even indulged in that conversation, uh, and and I know that sounds shocking to you. I've indulged in so many other conversations around this in terms of the due diligence. I haven't thought about if I announce how I would announce yet, but I know that I've got to figure that out quickly. And, uh, and so in the next couple of days, uh, most assuredly, there'll be some statement one way or another. Uh, one way or another. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, folks. Guys.